Hello, party people, and welcome to an episode of Office Hours. This will be a short one where I'll just tackle three questions from my porch at the Airbnb where we're staying at, at out in the Westman Islands. So there's a little elephant rock that back there behind me and a trio of small islands there. It's just been a beautiful place to sit and uh, do bird watching, listen to the ocean, and see some of the storms rolling through. So let's see, your number one upvoted question was from DK. DK asks, what was your SQL Server performance Gordian knot problem, and would it still be so today? So what a Gordian knot problem is for background is when there's this uh, really complex knot that you're supposed to untangle, and one way to solve it would be to take a sword and just cut right through the knot, like an in unconventional way to fix the problem, but a way nonetheless. Um, for me, I mean, there's been a bunch, but uh, that, that I, I can't talk about due to non-disclosure type stuff because it's all fairly fresh and recent. Um, but if there's one theme that comes back a lot, it's why are we storing that in a relational database? Like when you really you're facing this complex SQL Server problem, like, oh, we're trying to do queues inside the database. And I'm like, oh, there's a whole separate platform just for that or we're trying to store files in the database, and I'm like, well, why? And then people kind of look around, and they're like, you know, we're not really sure. Um, but one along those lines comes out to me big time that the company was trying to store versions of the database inside the same database. They were trying to store point-in-time captures of the database, all the tables in it, uh, going back through time. And they wanted, say, once a day snapshots. And of course, over time, that gets to become very large. And they were having problems with backup and recovery. And I'm like, well, wait, wait a minute. If it's just unwritable snapshots, like point in time pictures of the database, why does it need to be inside the same database? Why can't we put that in a different database called production underscore reporting or something? Um, and then that way, it'll get large, but it's only changing once a day. So we only need to do full backups for it. We don't ha need to have it in always on availability groups or database mirroring. We'll just do something simple like log shipping to copy it over once a day, or even full shipping if we wanted to, because it's not point in time changing throughout the day. And they're like, well, that would be a really hard re-engineering project. And I'm like, but would it really? Because if you're just querying tables, why don't I just leave views behind? Leave views behind where those tables used to be and have the views point over to the new database, production underscore reporting. And as far as the queries are concerned, nothing changes. They're like, oh, wow, okay, that's totally true. And they're like, well, what about we'd have to change everything that updates the, the uh, creates the snapshots. And I'm like, how hard is that really? Because it just looks like it's a select into. You could change that in 15 minutes. We can do a real quick find and replace and look for from space dbo dot and put, you know, or wherever the into was going. So that, that's the big one for me, I would say, is a theme overall, is getting things out of the production relational database that don't really have a reason for being there. Next up, we have George asks a big complex question. George says, Hi Brent, how exactly does locking work on an insert into select from? How do isolation levels work in that scenario? Let's obviously be on something that I can explain to you really quickly without doing things like demos. I do do demos of that kind of thing in my mastering index tuning and query tuning classes. But I, what I would say is that's not a sales pitch for the classes. For that, go see. Go open up Management Studio and have two windows. Have one window where you take out locks on a table. Have another window where you're trying to do your insert select from. Start transactions, see which parts of it get blocked, see which parts of it uh, use the prior version of the row instead of the next version of the row. See how your isolation level hints impact what you're trying to do. Like if you say set transaction isolation level snapshot, see if you can blow past a reading or writing transaction. Uh, there's really no experiment for doing those kinds of experiments, or there's really no replacement for doing those kinds of experiments yourself. And you can do them very quickly, especially when you know as much about the problem as you clearly do with your writing of the question. Now, if you're like, I don't want to do anyone, I don't want to do any work, I just want to have someone tell me the answers, the kind of good news is that that behavior hasn't changed in about 15, 
20 years. Um, there were some changes with RCSI and snapshot isolation. But you could go to your local neighborhood bookstore. You probably don't have a local neighborhood bookstore anymore. But you can go to your favorite online bookseller and you can pick up a book on SQL Server internals from 15 or 20 years ago. It'll be on sale because no one needs that anymore. You know, it's not like they're buying it off of, of booksellers. Um, they're just Googling and making things up as they go along. But you can go buy an older version of a SQL Server internals book and get a lot of information like that really inexpensively as opposed to having going to a training class. It just doesn't make sense to pay money for a training class based on the, the deep internals of what you're trying to do and how easy it would be to run experiments on your own to figure that out. Next up, uh, uh, Michael Dever asks, is there any way within SQL Server to tell if the cores that you're running on are the hyper-threaded cores versus the actual hardware? My friend heard that the hyper-threaded core does not really provide as much capacity as the physical core. Okay, first off, your friend is wrong. But then, and I, I do love that you, that you pitched it that way. First off, your friend is wrong. But the second thing is, what action would you take given that information? If you ran a query and saw that hyper-threading was turned off or on, what are you actually going to do about it? If what you would do is go to the sysadmin and have them change your VM configuration, then just go. Go to the sysadmin and say, hey, I believe, you know, my friend told me that I should only be on physical cores. If you're running under virtualization, they're going to laugh you out of the shop. It just doesn't make sense to you to turn off hyperthreading in a virtualized environment where you need as many core counts as you possibly can to sustain as many servers as you possibly can. If you're running on bare metal, odds are you're probably not that CPU confined anyway. The difference in performance between a physical core and a hyperthreaded core is just not that high. Uh, so what I would do is say, if you're bottlenecked on CPU, focus on doing, in, doing index tuning or query tuning to solve that problem, because the changing of turning on and off hyperthreading isn't going to be the piece that gets you across the finish line. Um, and then, uh, let's see, we'll do one more. Uh, Good Morning Party People asks, what are the most common SQL anti-patterns that you're seeing? Ooh, the most common anti-patterns that I'm seeing... Um, there's just so many, and I, I kind of go through them in my fundamentals of query tuning class. If I had to boil it down to just a couple, I would say not understanding what's sargeable. Uh, there are things where SQL Server can use a, uh, an index quickly with your search arguments to read as little data as possible and get, to the, get across the finish line. That's probably number one, is not understanding what's sargeable inside a where clause. And um, number two is doing a dozen, two dozen joins and expecting SQL Server to provide good estimates. The way I would to paraphrase that, in, and I talk about this in my Master in Query Tuning class, is imagine that I told you right now, I'm going to have you go to your closest recipe book in the kitchen. Imagine that you've got a recipe book in the kitchen. I want you to find the first recipe that has an ingredient in it. And I'm going to tell you what the ingredient is, but not yet. It's going to be a variable. So I'm going to tell you to go to the, to the recipe book. Find the first recipe that has an ingredient. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. And then I want you to go buy over to the shopping, uh, over to your grocery store, and get all of the things that are needed for that recipe. How many, how big of a, a shopping cart do you think you're going to need at the grocery store? It's really hard to guess when you don't know the ingredient. Like, what if I tell you that that ingredient is flour? And it's going to be really easy to go to the recipe book and quickly find something that has flour in it. It's probably going to be on one of the earlier pages. But what if I tell you saffron? an ingredient that isn't used all that often. And what if it just so happens that inside that recipe book, that the re first recipe about saffron is about making paella, which takes a big giant pan, for 50 people. It's hard to predict what the recipe is going to be, how big of a shopping cart you're going to need, how complex the recipe is going to be, what kinds of utensils you're going to need. It's very hard to predict all that stuff. 
when you don't even know the first ingredient. And I see people doing 10, 20, 30 joins, and they do the whole thing inside a stored procedure where the first thing is a parameter. We don't know how many rows are going to come back. It's really hard to estimate that stuff. So that's why often we need to break a query up into phases in order to get the best results. All right, so that is, we went uh, for a little while there for like 10 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and stop here because I've got to go uh, hit the ferry. I've got to go catch the ferry to get back onto the mainland. Erica and I are now going back over to mainland Iceland where our uh, kind of main crash pad is in uh, Reykjavik. And uh, we'll be in Reykjavik next week. I'm teaching my Mastering Parameter Sniffing class. Then a friend of mine's coming over from Georgia, and we're going to go drive around the country uh, and uh, show off a bunch of stuff here in Iceland. So thanks for hanging out with me at Office Hours, and I'll see you all next time.